I'm here to um, put Lant back in the box <laughs> and save Homie from Lant's attack. <laughs> and for me, the point is that the median is the message. It's a good measure of development. I'm go so I'm going to put Lant back in the box. <clears throat> and I'm also going to complain about another global institution, not the United Nations, but the World Bank, which surprisingly has its own measures of development progress recently announced, independent of Homie's high-level panel. Actually, Homie, Land, and Nancy all worked at the World Bank. So it gives you a feel for how we are all inside some box. And one of the wonderful things about this conference is that most of you are outside of our box, at least my box. So it's, it's always interesting to interact with you. So anyway, my, my point, I have a PowerPoint. I'm an economist. <coughs> and uh, Christian Mayer, my colleague, is here to answer any of the questions you might have about details. <laughs> so the median is the message. It's a good measure of development. It gets us away from the line. And um, I, what we're talking about is median consumption per person. So does anyone want to venture the median, let's say, income per person per day in this room? Come on, Ricardo Lant. You guys know. Close. Be I would guess three or four hundred, even counting that there may be some students. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the good things about the median is it's robust to the outliers, whether there's a couple of young people in the room who are graduate students here at the Kennedy School. And there may be a couple of very rich people in the room if Ricardo and the Center for International Development have their act together. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so I want to make three points about the median and convince all of you to convince the United Nations and the World Bank to let go of all this, these complications with the possible exception of this issue of sustainable development, which I agree is, is, a, is, a, is an interesting one that I'm not going to address directly. But let go of all the complications and go for the median. And I want to make three points about a household survey-based median as, a, as a, the advantages. First, it's simple and understandable, halfway between the richest and the poorest in whatever country or world or whatever. Second, it's durable over time and across countries. The middle income countries can uh, buy into it and worry about it in a way that they won't, as Lance suggested, when the line is, when there's an extreme poverty line. And also, it's a good enough measure of inequality, which I'll explain. So this is a complicated picture, but not that complicated uh, for those of you in the room. We have gross national income per capita on the horizontal axis and median income per person on the vertical axis. So you want to be up there in the northeast corner where we are in the US right now here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. That's where you, have, you live in a country that has high GNI per capita, income per capita, and, relative, and high median income. The size of the bubbles indicates the poverty rate. So you can see that there's a lot of countries in the bad corner in the southwest where they have low per capita income and median income below that red line, which we inserted as $2 a day. In fact, many of them are below $1 and $25 a day. And not surprisingly, the poverty rate, which is signified by the size of the circle, is very high, where median income is very low. So this captures some of the simplicity behind median income, but also the fact 
it conveys a lot about what's going on in the world. Now, that's Bangladesh. Median income is very low. The poverty rate is very high. You don't need to know that the poverty rate is very high. Or you know it implicitly once you know that median income in Bangladesh is about a dollar and a quarter a day. The Philippines, we think of as a lower middle income country. Median income is barely over two dollars a day. There are a lot of really poor people in the Philippines. Don't forget the median income in this room is probably three or four hundred dollars a day. There's rural China, and you can see urban China with much higher median income. So that tells you right away something about income inequality between rural and urban China anyway. And Mexico is so rich compared to these low income countries that it doesn't actually fit on this chart. Because median income in Mexico is about $7 a day. But it's so poor that it's only $7 a day. And your median income, whomever you are in this room, or your income, whomever you are in this room, is at least 10 times and maybe 20, 30 times that of the typical person in Mexico. So median income tells us a lot that the poverty gap and the poverty line tell us, tells us and more. The developing country median, I shouldn't have shown you, I should have had you guess, <laughs> is about $3 a day. All over the developing world, $3 a day. So median income tells us a lot in the sense that you get the sense of how poor people are. Now, if we collapse this picture so that it reflects something else, namely median income in the rich world, signified here by United States, where, by the way, that $40 is probably wrong. It's probably closer to $50 or $60 a day in the US. What's important in this picture is there's another line. Lant doesn't like lines. But we've imposed another line at $10 a day. And I think, we sh I think of it as the poverty vulnerability line. Now, those of you who heard Sendel last night will remember, perhaps, that I asked him, what do you mean by poverty? And he did not answer. It's below $2 a day or below $1 and $25 a day, did he? He said, it has to do with volatility. It has to do with vulnerability. It has to do with living with scarcity of money. So all you think about, you use up all your bandwidth worrying about money. Do you remember what Mr. Bohanini said? Bohanini, if I got it right. His I wouldn't call them the middle class, because I think of the middle class as at least above $10 a day. As when you get to the middle class, you are more secure. You have back your nine points of IQ. But that line, at least in Latin America, is somewhere around $10 a day. We know from empirical work. When you're below $10 a day in a household, over the next few years or in the past few years, you have been poor. You are floating around below $10 a day. Remember, Sendel said, some, I think Sendel said it, some people have you know, huge changes in their monthly income. That's why they want insurance. That's why that, that market of people below $10 a day, but well above a dollar in a quarter a day is a huge market for social insurance because they live with insecurity. So I'm trying to put Lant back in a box in which the median matters. Now, second, so that was all about simplicity, the simplicity of the median. Here's 
here's an indication of how it's durable. I'm, by durable, I mean it, it has relevance, it has salience if you're the finance minister in Mexico, as well as if you're the finance minister or the head of state in Bangladesh, because you want to get past at least $10 a day. And if the rest of the world has gotten to, you know, in the rich world has gotten really, really rich, maybe $10 a day is, is not going to signify the kind of security that we're talking about. Uh, you want to be a middle class society. And when you're a middle class society, you, the peop, most people will demand government that's accountable and responsive. So this is all, it's a better measure of development. It's durable over the long run. And here I have the BRICS. It gives you a better feel. What, we talk about the BRICS all the time, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Look how different they are when you look at median income per person. Now what about inequality? I haven't said much about the World Bank. The World Bank, President Kim recently said, we're going to have two things we'll measure. One was a goal, ex eliminate extreme poverty by 2030. Or actually, it says get it down to 3%, recognizing, I guess, that it can never be eliminated. I don't know. And the second wasn't a goal. It was just we're going to measure something we'll call shared prosperity. And that's the extent of growth of the bottom 40% of the population. So I want to show you why the median, if you compare it to the mean in a country, which many more people can understand, is a better measure. So the first thing is to say it's a good enough measure of inequality compared to the Gini coefficient, which is a familiar, much used measure by economists around the world. If you put the mean over the median at the country level, this is the kind of picture you get. It's basically so close to the Gini that those of you who don't know what the Gini is can now get a feel, or could, about the income distribution in your country if you knew mean income over median income. This shows you growth of the bottom 40% in income, which is what the World Bank is going to be now tracking compared to the change over time in the income of the household or the person at the median of the income distribution. For the most part, they track each other very nicely. So I hope I've convinced you that you don't need to worry about what the World Bank measures in a very complicated way using elaborate data as the how much has the how much income has changed for the bottom 40% of the population? Mean income. Now, one of the things that probably may have occurred to you about that measure is, what about the people at the top? Are the, all those people protesting in Chile, in Brazil, in Turkey, in Egypt during the Arab Spring, what were they complaining about? Weren't they complaining about the possibility that the guys at the top were capturing all the political and economic rents, that there was some sense of injustice and unfairness. I don't know how many of you know what happened to who Mohammed Bouazizi is. Right. Mohammed Bouazizi is the, the man who immolated himself and triggered the Arab Spring. And he's a he was a Tunisian. And if you read the newspaper reports, he was not poor. He often gave away from his vegetable cart, which, by the way, the police were, they were extorting from him. So he was being harassed by the state. He was, n in that sense, Tunisia was, is not a very developed economy by a broad definition of what the state's doing. He was giving away sometimes vegetables and other produce to those who were poor in his village. But he was certainly not middle class. He was in a situation where when they took away his vegetable cart, his sole asset for earning money was gone. 
we figure he was in a household that maybe four dollars, five dollars a day. So his income could grow by five percent. Say his his household's annual income was a thousand a year for simple numbers, grows by five percent to one thousand fifty a year. Say he has in mind some guy who's the cousin of, you know, the justice minister who earns a hundred thousand a year. And his income grows by five percent. So now the cousin of the justice minister is almost five thousand dollars richer, four thousand nine hundred and fifty dollars richer. Now, when the World Bank measures the rate of growth of income at the bottom 40% and says, wow, it's 5%. That's fabulous. Don't you want to know what happened to the rate of growth of people at the top of income? The World Bank is thinking in logs, like economists. But the rest of the world thinks in absolute numbers. This tells you something about changes over time in the past, two minutes, in these countries for two groups of people, everybody under $10 and everybody over $10, changes in their median income in the past. And what you see is, well, I haven't got that quite right, but don't worry. It's changes in the overall median for the population and changes for those under $10. And what it's trying to show is what we would call marginalization of everybody under $10. It's the disequalizing arithmetic of equally shared growth. So re we all need to rethink what the World Bank means by shared prosperity and shared growth. It's only shared in logs. It's not shared in reality. And these people under $10 whose income, of course, they're different people over time. In India is growing from, say, 3.8 to $4.3. They're going to be 76% of the population in 2030 still in India, and 60% of the population in Mexico, and even in Chile, still 30% of the population. And look what's happening to them in Chile. These are projections that we think are quite reasonable using country-specific rates of growth. Now, you know, what worries me as an American citizen, I think one of the few Americans other than land to get up and talk to you today, American-born to get up and talk to you today, is the U.S., it sort of feels like Chile is getting, could become. We have an underclass that lives in a very volatile situation with a lot of insecurity under probably $15 a day. So the median is the message. It's simple and understandable. It's durable over time. It's meaningful. It has salience in many countries. And it's a good enough measure of inequality. I hope I've helped put Lant back in the box and complement all of the things that Homie said about narrow but also broad measures by saying, mm, maybe there's one or two narrow measures that can give us quite a lot of information. Thank you very much.